everyone, Jesse Shade from Awfully Good Movies here, and before we dive into our yearly list for the worst movies of 2023, I'd like to address all the social media hoopla made recently about worst of the year list, and what purpose they still serve other than being mean to the hardworking people of Hollywood. Especially after a year where the writers and actors strikes hurt just about everybody. Well, in the case of our show, we are all about celebrating the good things that come out of bad movies, not trying to ensure that the artists who made them feel bad. In fact, that's why our reader poll we take at the end of the year gets recalculated against each movie's IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes scores to ensure that our ranking is based more on actual quality than popularity. That's why we haven't included every disappointing blockbuster that came out this year. No Indiana Jones 5, no Ant-Man 3 or the Marvels, and certainly no Rebel Moon Part 1, since that movie came out right after our poll anyway. Because we don't want this list to just be about hitting easy targets or trying to make the film discourse any meaner than it already is. And that's why I hope that if any of the filmmakers or actors behind the films on this list are watching this video, they don't take any of my jokes to heart. Filmmaking is a harder business than ever, and we only do these lists and reviews of supposedly bad movies to have a much needed laugh over it all. Out of all the actually horrific things that went down in the world these past few years, the crew behind these 10 movies were responsible for none of them. Well, with the exception of Ezra Miller. Yay! Besides, we can't pretend that bad movies don't exist any more than we can pretend that Madam Web movie isn't just a fake trailer that Sony made as a joke. No folks, it's a very real movie, and we have to muster up some courage in this divided nation to keep mocking such surely to be bad movies as that one, if only to honor the memory of Dakota Johnson's mother who was in the Amazon researching spiders right before she died. Your sacrifice will not have been in vain, Mrs. Madam Web. So without further ado, JoeBlow.com and Awfully Good Movies present the top 10 worst movies of 2023. Here we go! Number 10, 80 for Brady. With their Netflix sitcom Grace and Frankie all wrapped up after seven seasons, the legendary Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin could now team back up on the big screen in their late 80s. Without having to reunite with Dolly Parton and Dabney Coleman for a retirement home set sequel to 9 to 5. Instead, Fonda and Tomlin would pair up with two other female legends of the silver screen, Sally Field and Rita Moreno. In this true story-inspired comedy of a quartet of elderly gal pals who bond over watching Tom Brady play quarterback for the New England Patriots, who win some tickets to finally see Brady play in person during his team's legendary performance in the 2017 Super Bowl. That is, if a bunch of wacky hijinks don't get in the way first. Sure, it may not be too far off from the kind of comedy that Lemon and Mathow did together in their final years, but the results feel less like a movie and more like a bad sitcom episode stretched painfully thin over 90 minutes, complete with special guest star cameos from the likes of Guy Fieri, Patton Oswalt, Billy Porter, and Tom Brady himself, who in addition to co-producing this flick, delivers an acting performance alongside Lily Tomlin that will not be putting him on the Oscar shortlist anytime soon. You inspire me, and your courage inspires me. Yet the sitcom humor bumps up uneasily against the dramatic subplots of our four leading ladies. Lily Tomlin's cancer might be coming back. Sally Field's marriage is falling apart. Jane Fonda's face has been afflicted with the same de-aging CGI disease as De Niro in The Irishman and Rita Moreno has realized that her being 92 years old completely invalidates the premise of this film's title. So unless you think these esteemed female icons of film should spend their final years dancing their asses off to Lady Gaga, then let 80 for Brady be retired from our memories, just as Tom Brady himself is now retired from football. Unless, of course, he decides to come back yet again in the distant future. To serve as the basis for the sequel, Brady is 80. Let's fucking go! <laughs> number 65, 9. Or, I mean, number 9, 65. Adam Driver has proven in the past few years to be one of our best and most versatile actors of this generation. Just as long as you don't end up wasting him as badly as those Star Wars sequels did. 
But even though Driver was done with Star Wars, he was not done with the sci-fi genre. By starring in this space-traveling thriller from producer Sam Raimi and A Quiet Place writers Scott Beck and Brian Woods, where Driver would play a pilot living 65 million years ago on a distant planet, who's convinced by his wife to go out on a two-year space expedition so he can raise money to save their daughter from her unnamed coughing disease. I think I'm getting the black lung, Bob. Only for his spaceship to get caught in an asteroid shower and crash land on an alien planet, which just so happens to be our planet 65 million years ago in the past, hence the title 65. But what could have been a promising and original sci-fi adventure would end up feeling derivative of a million sci-fi movies before it, as Driver traverses the prehistoric landscape with a little girl speaking a foreign language, played by Lil Gamora and Ahsoka herself, Ariana Greenblatt, and faces off against the dinosaurs who are on their trail to make this feel barely different from any of the terrible Jurassic World sequels that have made this list previously. While the cinematic landscape is very much in need of some original sci-fi properties, 65's originality as a premise is undercut by all the dramatic plot devices that we've seen too many times, with little depth or humanity between either of our lead characters. But with Adam Driver already moving back towards prestige dramas from the likes of Michael Mann and Francis Ford Coppola, this dinosaur dud will surely be nothing more than a blip on his otherwise steady career. Fuck you, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Number 8. Five Nights at Freddy's This new year marks the 10th anniversary for the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise which all started with the indie video game that placed the player in the role of a security guard who works the night shift at a Chuck E. Cheese's type family pizzeria, overseeing the cameras to make sure that the secretly homicidal friendly mascots don't escape the premises or ensnare you in their animatronic claws. It was a simple yet effective game for players of all ages, as well as a boon for the Let's Play industry on YouTube. But it wasn't as simple to get this franchise onto the big screen after the planned Warner Brothers adaptation was transferred over to Universal Pictures and their Blumhouse Productions. With original writer and director Chris Columbus soon jumping off the project after several delays brought about by game creator Scott Cawthorn and indie filmmaker Emma Tammy now serving as Columbus's replacement on our final film, which has Josh Hutcherson in the role of the security guard who's struggling to provide for his younger sister with a security job down at Freddy Fazbear's, where he must survive the next five nights of hell ahead of him. Unfortunately, there's a whole lot of dull padding in between those five nights, as well as the overly complicated lore behind these killer mascots that was added in the later games, which made them come off more silly than scary. And though the PG-13 lack of gore was true to the game's bloodless nature, it just came off as cheap, even for a Blumhouse movie, with the best kill by far going to Matthew Lillard in a nod to his screen days, as the secret serial killer who's been putting his young victims' bodies inside these animatronic mascots. I made you! And who overacts his death scene like he just ate some bad Chipotle. <laughs> Not only did this movie prove to be a much needed boost for Matthew Lillard's career, but the movie itself blew away expectations by becoming Blumhouse's biggest worldwide grocer of all time at the box office, in spite of the film also streaming on Peacock at the same time. So no amount of bad reviews can stop Blumhouse's continued expertise with cheap yet profitable horror cinema. Unless of course you're talking about their other horror flick that came out near Halloween, but we'll get there folks, trust me. Number 7, Fast X. You would think that the Fast and Furious franchise would want to reset after the comparably disappointing performance of F9 with critics and audiences, but Vin Diesel and his ever-growing family of street racers turned super spies raced on into its 10th installment, the first of three parts of the franchise's alleged finale but this time without longtime series director Justin Lin, who reportedly clashed on the set with Vin Diesel over his out-of-shape body and frequently forgotten dialogue, to the point of shouting, This movie is not worth my mental health! So with Transporter and Incredible Hulk's Louis Leterrier taking his place in the director's chair, Fast X would now have Dom Toretto and family facing off against the vengeful son of the dead villain back in Fast Five 
Jason Momoa as Dante Reyes, who is having the time of his life going out of Aquaman mode to basically play a far better portrayal of the Joker than Jared Leto's. <laughs> Sadly, Momoa is among the many names from past films, as well as such new names as Brie Larson and the guy who plays Jack Reacharound, who struggle to juggle screen time in this franchise's increasingly swollen cast, including Jason Statham back as Deckard Shaw in one of the three films he'll end up having on our list, John Cena as Dom's no longer evil brother, and both Gal Gadot and Dwayne Johnson returning to the franchise after their embarrassing exits from the DCEU in post credits cameos and who will hopefully not be doing a duet together for the next movie soundtrack it's about drive it's about power we say <laughs> this unfortunately leads to the most disjointed flick in the series to date where all the cartoonish chaos has taken away from any reality these characters used to have back in their street racing days. And none of the characters deaths can be taken seriously anymore when they all keep coming back from the dead anyway. As for Vin Diesel, his stoically macho persona has become far too silly for us to take seriously anymore, especially now that he's up against Jason Momoa's Looney Tune of a villain. So with Fast X's production budget careening out of control to be 70% more expensive than that of F9, and the sequel coming out the same month as another big franchise follow-up that co-starred Vin Diesel, this Fast installment barely crawled into the black at the box office, far behind the pace of the previous films, leading to doubts about the next two sequels they've got planned, with the first set for April 2025, now that the Hollywood strikes have set back production. Only time will tell if Dom and his family can refuel this franchise before it runs out of gas for good. Well, thank God I got through that segment without mentioning the lawsuit that just came out against Ben. Oh, God damn it! Ah! No! The movies. Number six, white men can't jump. In 1992, Bull Durham director Ron Shelton paired up the unlikely comedy duo of Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson in White Men Can't Jump where Wesley and Woody played a duo of streetball hustlers who overcome their racial differences to make some big money combining their skills out on the ball court. So 30-some years later, when Disney is eager to exploit every last property it bought up from 20th Century Fox whichever way they can, we now have ourselves an all-new take on this classic comedy, now starring Sinkwa Walls and rapper Jack Harlow in his debut acting role, as our two interracial enemies turned basketball buddies. One is a washed up college prodigy who threw away his career. The other is a goofy hippie who frequently injures himself out on the court. Can these two ever possibly get along? It's just as uninspired a remake as you would expect from a director named Al Maddock, who also made the terrible House Party remake that flamed out in theaters earlier last year, as well as co-writer Kenya Barris of Blackish fame, whose track record as a film writer is filled with unneeded remakes of or sequels to classic movies. Coming to America in particular was a big number two. But what was particularly uninspired was the chemistry between our two leads, with Jack Harlow in particular having the same comedy chops that Tom Brady demonstrated in 80 for Brady. Hell, poor Lance Reddick here in one of his last roles before his tragic death is more energetic than Jack Harlow is, and he spends much of the film laid up in a hospital bed. There's just no point in remaking a film that was so of its time like White Man Can't Jump unless it has either a Rosie Perez cameo or something new to say. But this remake was instead one of many missed shots that Disney made this past year, both in theaters and on streaming, which is exactly where the new white men can't jump belongs. God forbid that they bring these two back together for a remake of Money Train. Hell, they don't even deserve to be in a remake of Money Plane. Money Plane. Number five, Meg Two, The Trench. Back in 2018, we saw Jason Statham facing off against his biggest on-screen foe to date, a 75-foot prehistoric megalodon shark, in the adaptation of Steve Alton's best-selling sci-fi novel, The Meg, which despite its unenthusiastic reviews, was a worldwide hit that merited a sequel, since The Meg novel happens to have plenty of follow-ups itself. So for Statham's return as Jonas Taylor, the director's chair would now be filled by English auteur Ben Wheatley, best known for his darkly comedic indie thrillers of varying genres, 
With our sequel story focused on Statham going back under the sea with a research team to the same trench that those last few Meg sharks came from, only for the grown baby Meg that they've got in captivity to escape out into the trench and bring back a variety of aquatic creatures who seek to induce some carnage on the surface above. Yet while the trailers emphasize these big shark attack scenes near the end of the movie, the rest of the film is padded out with a lot of boring backstory about the underwater drilling operation that Statham is going up against, much of it being said in subtitled Chinese on behalf of the film's Chinese co-producers, despite Statham's core audience of action-loving bros hating to read. And while Ben Wheatley does handle the suspense and action quite efficiently, very little of his cinematic character or wit is seen on screen here to make this feel any different from any average CGI blockbuster. I mean, if the entire appeal of your franchise is getting to see Jason Statham kick some sharks in their goddamn faces, then just let that be most of your movie, and spare us all of this bullshit backstory that pads this movie out to nearly two hours long. You're not making killers of the flower moon, you're making kickers of the fucking shark! But with Meg 2 being just as globally successful at the box office as its predecessor, and Ben Wheatley saying that talks are already underway for a third Meg movie, let us just hope that Meg 3 finally reaches the levels of B-movie fun that certainly weren't reached with Meg 2. Hey, since Martin Scorsese has produced some of Ben Wheatley's movies in the past, maybe he can get back into acting by co-starring alongside Jason Statham in that next movie. Scorsese knows all about sharks, you know. He was in Shark Tale. Mrs. Molly Cobb who was buried in the old cemetery in Grey Horse beside her father, her sisters, and her daughter. There was no mention of the murders. That's messed up. Number four, The Flash. Finally, the DC Extended Universe came to its merciful end in 2023, and the past 10 years of reshoots, reboots, re-edits, and behind-the-scenes drama could make for a film itself that would end up being far longer than the Snyder Cut. But no one would be ready for the drama that would surround the Scarlet Speedster's long-delayed cinematic debut from MAMA and IT director Andy Muschietti particularly the film's returning lead actor, Ezra Miller, and their love for committing crime sprees that were far worse than sticking a CGI baby into a microwave, which would all unfortunately distract from the film's long-awaited return of none other than Michael Keaton in the role of Bird, or I mean, Batman. One of many names from past DC movies that would pop up in this film's loose adaptation of the infamous Flashpoint storyline which involves Barry Allen running back in time with his speed force to try and save his mother from being killed, as well as his father from being blamed for her murder, thus creating a new timeline for Barry where Batman has gone from Affleck to Keaton, Superman is now replaced by his cousin Kara, aka Supergirl, and Barry's teenage self is acting like the TikTok addicted son of Polly Shore. All this multiversal nonsense would only further muddy the narrative waters of the DCEU, with Ben Affleck at least trying his best in his brief return as Batman, and Sasha Kale making a great Supergirl, but the 70-year-old Michael Keaton as Batman getting very little to do, aside from fan-baiting with his old dialogue, You wanna get nuts? Come on! Let's get nuts. And handing off his fight scenes to his clearly younger stunt double, then along comes that infamously bad third act, with a clearly unenthusiastic Michael Shannon returning as General Zod alongside some of the very worst CGI in cinema history, resulting in ghoulish posthumous cameos from Christopher Reeve and George Reeves' Superman, as well as Helen Slater as the 80s Supergirl, and Nicolas Cage as his call L from Tim Burton's Unmade Superman Lives, with Cage himself just as baffled by his terribly rendered cameo as the audiences were. Though the term superhero fatigue is indeed overused these days, The Flash demonstrates why this genre is going through a rough patch by emphasizing fan service and half-assed CGI over any semblance of a coherent story that could have ended this turbulent franchise on a somewhat good note, instead of this jokey ending cameo from George Clooney returning as Bruce Wayne, with Clooney joking that there aren't enough drugs in the world for him to ever properly return to the Batsuit ever again. 
seeing as Ezra Miller already took all the drugs. How appropriate then that The Flash would have a crash at the box office far bigger than that of Batman and Robin, in spite of all the silly hype that Warner Brothers tried to build for its release. With both Blue Beetle and Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom similarly facing a grim fate at the box office afterwards. And though we certainly understand that The Flash does have some big name fans in its corner, it's hard to deny what an appropriately messy ending that The Flash was for whatever the hell this DCEU was supposed to be. And we can only hope that James Gunn's new Superman movie and Andy Muschietti's planned Batman movie will be a far better start for the new DCU. While Ezra Miller stays locked up in the deepest halls of Arkham Asylum where they belong. I am your new cellmate. You got up! Number three, The Exorcist Believer. 50 years ago, The Exorcist opened in theaters as a blockbuster phenomenon that had audiences fleeing from the theaters in fright and being followed up by a series of occasionally good but mostly terrible sequels and prequels. But 50 years later, on the same year that we sadly lost director William Freakin at the age of 87, we got yet another follow-up to The Exorcist from the same trio that gave us the Halloween sequels. Producer Jason Blum, co-writer Danny McBride, and director David Gordon Green. Who, despite their increasingly poor handling of that trilogy, now sought to begin an all-new trilogy of horror sequels that would canonically ignore all the rest of the franchise. With Believer focusing on Leslie Odom Jr. as a photographer who loses his pregnant wife, as well as his faith in God, after an earthquake in Haiti, but whose infant daughter Angela survives to grow up into a normal teenager, until she heads out to the woods with one of her friends, and the two girls come back with their bodies taken over by a demon. And this time, it's not a Pazuzu thus forcing poor dad to seek the advice of Ellen Burstyn, finally returning to the series at age 90 to the role of Chris McNeil, who only accepted this role for a big check towards her acting scholarship, and certainly not off the strength of her god-awful dialogue. Because I'm not a member of the damn Patriots. Shut your mouth! Not only has Burstyn written nothing like her character was in the first film, but her hyped-up role turned out to just be an extended cameo leaving the rest of the film to serve as an uninspired beat-for-beat -beat remake of the first Exorcist, without any purpose of its own, at least until the final act, where some priests of varying faiths all perform an exorcism on these girls. You've got to bring everyone together. Where it instead feels like a remake of the Exorcist parody film, Repossessed. Yet even with the surprise cameo from Linda Blair back as Reagan and the reshoots and re-edits that the movie underwent after poor test screenings, the new Exorcist was swiftly bashed by horror fans and film critics alike. What's the best bit about it? It ends. It would also quickly burn up at the box office up against Taylor Swift's Eras Tour movie, leaving in doubt the $400 million, yes, $400 million that Universal spent on acquiring The Exorcist rights, as the next installment of the planned trilogy, Deceiver, is now off the schedule now that Gordon Green's left the project and is allegedly undergoing a creative rethink from Blumhouse after Believer's failure. So with William Freakin joking before his death that his spirit would haunt David Gordon Green from the grave, Mr. Green better redeem his soul by getting back to making indie dramas with Nicolas Cage, instead of any more terrible and unneeded sequels to classic horror movies that are best left alone. Unless, of course, he wants to bring Ellen Burstyn and Linda Blair back together once more to finally make Repossess 2 the hilarious- Shut your mouth! Utterly horrible. Number 2, Expendables 4, aka Expend Forbles. What more can I say about this flick that I didn't already say in my last video on it? The franchise that originally teamed up Sylvester Stallone and Jason Statham back in 2010, alongside a rotating crew of their fellow action stars of both past and present, was backed by non-popular demand nine years after the failure of Expendables 3, and its starring lineup now down to the bench warmers for its fourth installment's cast. 
with Bruce Willis tragically diagnosed with dementia, Terry Crews refusing to return after the producers tried blackmailing him to hush up his assault allegations towards Stallone's agent, and Stallone himself returning at age 77 with no writing or producing credit since he was busy with his dueling Paramount Plus shows in what was basically a glorified cameo, so that Statham could take Sly's place in leading what was the most pathetic lineup of Expendables to date. 50 Cent, Megan Fox, Andy Garcia? This sounds like an alternate universe version of the Epstein list, not a cast of action legends. Aside from the great Eco Wise and Tony Ja, though their action choreography is hard to appreciate here, amidst all the quickly cut editing, shaky camera work, and obviously fake CGI blood that the great action movies of the 80s were never about, but which this Expendables franchise has had way too much of. How could this movie have been shown in IMAX screens, alongside the likes of Oppenheimer, when it looks like every late-stage Steven Seagal movie rolled into one? And as for Stallone, of course he doesn't end up dying at the film's end. But when you hear about the inexplicably horrific manner in which he took out this biker guy who took his place just for winning his ring in a thumb wrestling match, you'll be wishing that Barney Ross had stayed dead. No wonder Jet Li nor Arnold show back up for even a cameo, while Dolph Lundgren and Randy Couture come back mostly just to stand around and wonder what even is the point anymore. So to answer 50 Cent's question he posed on Instagram about his poster for this movie, did we run out of money? Well, yes, the fourth Expendables certainly did run out of money quickly, with a pathetic box office haul that barely covered half of its budget. So let's hope this series has finally died before Stallone does, and that Statham can move on to hopefully better sequels such as Fast X2, X-Men United, and Meg 3, Meg vs. Megan. While the Expendables finally live up to their namesake, after this new low for a franchise that has never had much of a high. And if they do make another movie, then hopefully the target of their next mission will be a retirement home. It's been and now, for our number one worst movie of 2023, a year so fucked up that it gave us the likes of Winnie the Pooh, Blood, and Honey. Thanks to the dark magic that is public domain, A.A. A. Milne's beloved Pooh Bear and his gang of fellow anthropomorphic animals could finally escape the shackles of their Disney prison and finally have a live action movie made about their dark and grisly origin story that A.A. A. Milne was too much of a pussy to put to paper. Brought to you by the British indie film studio Jagged Edge Productions, which specializes in taking once innocent public domain fairy tales and turning them into horrific reimaginings. And with the first Pooh book entering public domain in the US in 2022, the Jagged Edge crew decided to do the same with poor little Pooh Bear, who in this horror adaptation gets left behind by Christopher Robin now that he's gone off to college, forcing the Hundred Acre Wood gang to starve and turn feral on each other. Five years pass, and Christopher Robin comes back from college with his fiancée to find that the surviving Pooh and Piglet have become distorted life-size monsters, who stalk beyond the Hundred Acre Wood to brutally kill whoever comes in their sight. Yet once the movie itself finally came out and the internet buzz had died down, Blood and Honey turned out to be nothing more than another run of the Bill slasher flick, where the said slasher happens to be an awful-looking rendition of Woody the Pooh. Once all the shock value goes away, there's nothing left here other than a direct-to-video horror cheapie that's no better in quality than any Tubi original movie, aside from laughing occasionally at the actor playing Christopher Robin, taking this role just as seriously as Ewan McGregor did in that live-action Disney movie. You had enough people, boo! Please! But with the movie's internet buzz leading to the flick getting an American theatrical release that helped it make back far more than its $500,000 budget, disappointed audiences and critics who have stopped laughing at this joke of a premise will be saddened to hear that Blood and Honey 2 is hitting theaters next month as we speak, with the character of Tigger now getting a horrific reimagining that looks like a werewolf who escaped from prison. I'm sure that sequel can't be any worse than what Joe Blow readers have helped us determine to be a very deserving choice for the worst movie of 2023. 
As for me, I will be sticking with the live action Pooh special that Disney made in the 80s because a terribly costumed Pooh bear singing to your kids about the horrors of being sexually abused by strange adults is far scarier than any horror movie could be. No, don't do that. Take your hands away. <laughs> And there you have them, our top 10 picks for the worst movies of 2023, as helped by the amazing readers of Joblo.com. I'm Jesse Shade for Joblo.com, and thank you again for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Originals channel. Tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support. And now that 2024 has marked my 10th anniversary as a YouTube movie critic, I'm now going to go off and crawl into a pile of dust. It ends. family. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat>